Today, I have the great pleasure of interviewing Dr. Mike Riddell from York University, who studies exercise in type 1 diabetes. And I'm really excited to dig into this um, topic. For some reason, I have a passion for learning about type 1 diabetes, and even though I'm not type 1 diabetic myself, but I think it's super interesting to learn about the physiology in type 1s because, I don't know, it's like a, a lens into also normal physiology. Um, and there's a lot of things you can learn from type ones and control for that you can't really do in a, in a normal, uh, non-type one diabetic. I don't like the word normal. I don't know if that's like appropriate. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, I struggle with it too. Don't worry. Okay. Um, but anyways, if you wouldn't mind giving yourself an introduction, um, introduce your sure. research a bit, and then we'll go into some different questions. Sure. Well, first, Chrissy, thanks for having me on your show. It's a real pleasure. I, uh, I'm a researcher who actually lives with type 1 diabetes, and I was diagnosed as an adolescent, so it's given me lots of years of experience uh, learning about how exercise and stress affects um, my body. I am surrounded by graduate students and undergrads who have an interest in either exercise metabolism or type 1 diabetes. Maybe they have diabetes or a family member has diabetes. And I was always fascinated by how my body struggled with blood sugar management. Uh, during exercise, and that's why I got into research. Some of the work that our lab is doing is looking at trying to prevent low blood sugar and high blood sugar that's caused by exercise, coming up with new clinical guidelines on exercise management for type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and looking at a new drug that might help prevent low blood sugar and people who are on insulin therapy that, that get low blood sugar. So it's a real pleasure to be on your show. Well, thank you. Um, that last point about preventing low blood sugar with a medication or something that that's interesting. I want to come back to that. Um, but first I just want to get into more of your backstory. So what, and just general type one diabetes, like what are the recommendations when someone is diagnosed with diabetes as the doctor or endocrinologist, are they, do they walk them through like, what's going to happen when you exercise or you probably shouldn't exercise that? Like, what did, what do you, what are the general recommendations? Yeah, great question. Um, when people are diagnosed with type 1 or type 2 diabetes, they're a little bit in shock sometimes if they haven't connected with the disease. So uh, physicians normally, you know, try to calm them down saying life can resume some level of normal normalcy. Here are the medications. Here's your glucose meter. So you can check check your blood sugar. And then they start talking about lifestyle, maybe not in the first visit, but uh, they, they do bring it up pretty quickly. The American Diabetes Association and uh, the Canadian uh, Diabetes Canada recommends exercise for type one and type two. And I'm a part of the steering committee that comes up with these guidelines. We know it's so important for people with, with diabetes to be physically active. It helps with their their health, their blood sugar management, their insulin sensitivity. So that has to come forth to, to the patient. They have to be told that they should exercise. How much they do is around 150 minutes a week. You should try to do some resistance exercise because we know that aerobic and resistance have almost additive benefits. And so we try to convey that message to physicians and physicians to patients. Uh, but unfortunately, not everyone with diabetes is active. And that's something else that we try to work on advocacy and, and education. Yeah. So if you or someone's diagnosed and then they're like, oh, I'm going to go run with my friends and play. And then they're like, oh, crap, I'm experiencing all these fluctuations in blood sugar. I don't know how to manage it. Does that deter yeah. someone from exercising? Yeah. Some, some studies, not from my group, but from studies in Canada, uh, and in the UK have shown that a fear of low blood sugar when, when exercising is a real barrier to people participating if they're on insulin therapy. So if everyone on type 1 diabetes is on insulin, they might quickly find that uh, even walking can cause their blood sugar to drop and they get, they get uh, hypoglycemia. Uh, people with type 2 diabetes on insulin also can find that it can cause low blood sugar. So there is this initial fear. And sometimes that fear never goes away. We've met lots of individuals who won't exercise later in the day because they're worried they might have a low blood sugar reaction overnight when they're sleeping because that exercise effect lasts for more than just during the, the physical activity. Actually, you were talking about how uh, exercise teaches us about normal physiology. Well, it was discovered uh, because of diabetes that when the muscles contract, they take up glucose independent of insulin. That discovery, which is so important in physiology, was because of diabetes. So, you know, it, it comes as some with some benefits, but also some side effects that we have to manage clinically. 
Yeah. And I'm happy you brought up uh, insulin independent glucose uptake because the way I see type one management is like, our muscles have two doors. One requires requires insulin as the key and the other uh, requires exercise as a key. Um, and yeah. can, can they be used interchangeably? Um, could you almost like manage your blood sugar by instead of injecting insulin, could you just go for a walk? <laughs> That's a great question. And this is a question that was first asked maybe in the 1970s, where they would take animal models of type 1 diabetes and they would get them to exercise. And sometimes they'd have to use muscle stimulation to get them to, to do exercise. And it was showing that the muscles were perfectly happy. They could take up all the glucose that they needed, but the animal was not healthy because when you have no insulin in the body, it becomes very difficult, uh, basically because liver produces a lot of glucose and ketones. So that can be dangerous. So in a way, the muscles are happy without insulin when they exercise, but the rest of the body is not. So you need some insulin in the body. And it's important that we convey that message to people who have to take insulin to stay alive. They need some insulin in their bodies to, even when they exercise. Now, if you have type 2 diabetes, you probably produce enough insulin that you can get away without being on any medications if you stick to a good dietary management program and, and, and some daily exercise. That was a great question. And this might be a little ignorant, but can you just explain like what, how you manage with insulin? Like there's the basal insulin yeah. and then rapid acting. And that's more for like meals and acute. Sorry. Yeah. You can just explain yeah. that. <laughs> okay. So, well, we should just uh, acknowledge that insulin has been around for 100 years because this is the anniversary of the discovery of insulin. And back in the 1920s, patients with type one diabetes, the kind of diabetes that I have, would take two or three injections a day of this insulin they used to call uh, Toronto insulin or regular insulin. And that insulin kind of works okay for meals, but it doesn't work very good in between meals or overnight where the body needs a little bit of insulin. So over time, uh, scientists could invent a, what's called a basal insulin, which acts in between meals and overnight to prevent the liver from producing toxic ketones. So basically everybody with type one diabetes now is on at least two types of insulin. If they take it by needle, they take a basal and a bolus insulin. Now, if you're on an insulin pump, which can infuse insulin throughout the day, you can get away with one type of insulin. It just changes the infusion rate. And that's what, that's what I use. And uh, my son has type one and he uses a, an automated insulin delivery system, which kind of delivers insulin based on his own blood sugars, which is kind of neat because that can now be measured with a glucose sensor. So basically when you exercise, you need to turn down the bolus insulin if you're gonna exercise after a meal or turn down the basal insulin if you're gonna exercise in between meals. That's basically in a nutshell what you have to try to do. And it's not easy. Yeah, so is it extremely unpredictable? Like even yourself, you're probably the most well-educated type one diabetic who also exercises. Um, do yeah, you even well, still struggle? Like, is oh it yeah, absolutely. I show, I get a lot of mileage showing my mistakes, <laughs> to be honest, at conferences or, um, you know, even in the literature. I think we learn from making mistakes and we still all make mistakes because we think that there could be over 50 factors that impact our blood sugar levels. Like insulin and exercise and our food are three common ones, but there's all these other factors that might come into play. You know, if you're under stress, uh, for females during different phases of menstrual cycle, during the aging process, as I've now in my fifties, like the biology always changes. And so to, to nail insulin for exercise is much more difficult than, than at rest even because the glucose turnover rate changes so quickly. Like, let's say that you're in a competitive mixed martial arts event and you've got the stress of going into a fight that's only going to last for a few minutes. That's very different than you know, going for a walk with the dog or going for a bike ride on the weekend. So the physiology is so complex and I make tons of mistakes still. Yeah. Well, you can't also predict like, is this hockey game going to stress me out or not? Like, am I going to be nervous? Am I going to like you, how do you yeah. even predict your response to the environment? Um, right. So I right. can and I, definitely and see. And I'm just like the average, uh, you know, active person with diabetes, but I've worked with several elite level athletes with type one, Max Domi, who plays in the NHL. I've had conversations with Gary Hall Jr., who was really the first Olympian with diabetes in 
he, he could do the 50 meter swim in 50 seconds and his blood sugar just skyrocketed high, right? So learning from these athletes, Sebastian Sasseville, who just raced across Canada on a bike with type one using an automated insulin delivery system. We learn so much from these exceptional athletes, but we also learn from kids who are newly diagnosed and people my age who are trying to still be active. And to go back to what you said about the swimmer, um, I forget his Gary, name. Gary, yeah, Gary. <laughs> Gary. Um, can you explain why our blood sugar would spike in response to like a high intensity yeah. of exercise? Well, and this is what really got me excited in the 1990s when I took up the research that I was doing for my PhD and then eventually my postdoc. Um, we think that the catecholamines, when, when they rise during competition stress, they are almost squeezing glucose out of the liver. And the catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine, they seem to prevent, well, slow down the glucose uptake into muscle. So we talked about contraction mediated glucose is pulling glucose in. The catecholamines put a bit of a break on that. So if the liver's dumping glucose in the bloodstream and the catecholamines are preventing it from leaving the bloodstream, the glucose can rise rapidly. And so Gary, when he was testing his blood sugar before his um, Olympic gold medal race, his blood sugar was around you know, six or seven millimoles. And then the excitement, the adrenaline of, of being on the blocks and then hearing the gun and then swimming as hard as he's ever swam in his life for just 20 seconds caused such an adrenaline rush, his blood sugar went up to around 25 millimole in, in 20 seconds, which is unheard of. In fact, I'd never, I never, I didn't even believe it could happen. But <laughs> if you if you think about how much sugar your bloodstream holds it's only around five or six grams so when the liver dumps glucose boom the blood sugar goes up so stories like that really got me excited about stress physiology exercise physiology yeah why would our muscles shut down glucose uptake well we think it's because uh, what's in our muscle that gives us fuel as well you you took uh, oh. botany as an undergrad but now you're a <laughs> master's student so what Glycogen? what is the yeah Chat? so <laughs> Glycogen and and some muscle triglycerides. When you go as hard as you want, sorry, as hard as you can on a sprint, you use so much muscle glycogen that you don't really need blood sugar as a fuel. So you, you basically need the blood sugar when you're doing more aerobic activities or milder activities. And I think the, that's been really fascinating to learn how in diabetes that can really mess up your blood sugar control. If you don't have diabetes and you do this event, you see a small rise in your blood sugar, but then your pancreas will secrete insulin to push it back down. And right. uh, that's why you're normal and I'm abnormal, what, or whatever <laughs> we want to call ourselves. Yeah, we need some better words for, for this yeah. description. Um, so if a type 1 diabetic is going to do high intensity, I've heard like talk about like a cool down, the importance of a cool down afterwards to kind of mediate yeah. that rise in blood sugar. So could you explain that a bit? So I, so I met this physiologist uh, named Inigo Samalan. He is a physiologist that specializes in elite level athletes who are cyclists. And he's helped some of the people reach like the Tour de France and the podium. So uh, Inigo and I were talking about how when he was meeting athletes with type 1 diabetes, including Team Novo Nordisk, he found that this aerobic cool down really brought their sugars down uh, without the need for any insulin injection, which, you know, you can overdo, you can take a shot of insulin after exercise, and then if you go to bed, you might have low blood sugar. So Inigo taught me that this was a really cool way for people with diabetes to cool down and then recruit the glucose uptake that's contraction mediated, get the, get the catecholamines down, and then the blood sugar normalizes. So that was a huge lesson that I learned from one of the top physiologists um, on the planet, really. Yeah, I'm obsessed with his research. And uh, it's actually motivating a lot of my future research or my hope to research yeah, good. in mitochondrial good. function and everything. So I'm happy you brought him up and made me yeah, really excited. Yeah. That's <laughs> um, awesome. But, uh, oh, shoot, I lost my train of thought with what I was going to go with. Well, that, we we're talking though. about high blood sugar and how to correct it. We oh, published... Does Oh, sorry. We Go published, on. we, we did publish one study not that long ago where, um, you can give a shot of insulin in earlier recovery, but because 
maybe you don't have time for the cool down or maybe the cool down doesn't work, you're still hyperglycemic. So we published one study where you could give a bolus correction after exercise. And in fact, uh, you, could, you could make this bolus correction really intelligent by looking at the change in glucose and your own insulin sensitivity, give that bolus correction, and then you're down um, before your next meal. And in fact, in our study, we had everyone exercise in the fastest state in the morning which sometimes people exercise fasted and their blood sugar went quite, quite high. And if they didn't correct with insulin, they were high for the whole day. So that we were able to show that we could safely bring that down by insulin injection. So I think insulin can be given uh, or you can do Dr. Inigo's approach and try the cool down or maybe the combination of the two with less insulin. Would the cool down be like advantageous maybe for later in the day to prevent nocturnal hypoglycemia? I don't think so. I think that we have seen in our literature that nocturnal hypo is just so darn common. And no matter what we do, people are at risk. So uh, we think it's because there is a lot of glycogen depletion when you do intensive exercise. And if the muscle glycogen in, in you know, your arms and legs are low, that also seems to pull in glucose uh, independent of, of insulin. Hmm. or the insulin sensitivity pathway is, is heightened. Either way, we see that about 50% of athletes with diabetes still get nocturnal hypoglycemia if they do afternoon exercise. And it's tough to prevent. That's so interesting. It makes me think that like the hierarchy of glucose, like for some reason it's going to our muscles instead of what fueling our brain. Like you think that it would be able to preferentially, I don't know, like uh, that, you know, that's such a great thought. I hadn't thought about this, but you're right. There is almost like a, a priority that the muscle says I'm the most important because I need to be ready for the next fight or flight response. Like I need right. to have energy in my tank in case I need to run away. And maybe that is some sort of evolutionary trait where you'd think the brain, the CNS would be most important to preserve because if blood sugar is low, as you probably know, you can't really function. You could even pass out right. and have convulsions, but the muscles are damn greedy. They seem to pull it in, Apparently, even, if yeah. the, even if the brain needs it. What a great analogy. I like that. And uh, do you think like, so I know that there's lots of athletes that follow low carb, like mostly endurance athletes that do carbohydrate yeah. restriction. Yep. And they rely a lot more on fatty acid metabolism than glycogen. Mm -hmm. So if there's a mm -hmm. glycogen sparing effect, do you think that that could benefit a type one diabetic? The low carb approach? Yeah. Yeah. This is a controversial topic. We just had a debate at the last American Diabetes Association conference where I was the moderator of this debate. And there Wait, was this with Dom Diagostino? Yeah. I work, so for, I work for Dom. Okay. I, I'm so, I'm super aware of his presentation. <laughs> Okay, so we've got, you know, Nick Morton, who is a high carb fanatic who helped Team Sky, you know, reach the podium in the Tour de France. And then we've got Dom, who's got some great research on, you know, the potential benefits of low carb and, and even in diabetes. What a great debate. My mind is still not made up. I can see pros and cons of both approaches. And even, even me, I will experience days where I'd like to go low carb, but not ketogenic. Um, for various reasons that we could get into. But we have published, me and Sam Scott have published a review article on this, looking at all the evidence that we can find on health risks and benefits of low carbon type 1 diabetes, particular for athletes. So if anybody's interested, they can find that on Nutrients uh, website, where we do look at the, the benefits and potential risks of low carb. I, I just must say, though, that if you look at Team Novo Nordisk, um, who we've done work with, they're the best cyclists in the world with diabetes, arguably, and none of them are on low carb. I don't think any of them could manage a seven day stage race on a low carb diet. So I think it's okay for some athletes, but I don't recommend it for all athletes living with type one. Are they on high carb relative to non type one diabetics or are they a low carb relative? Cause like a cyclist yeah, on... could be consuming like 800 grams and still be on a low carb diet relative to yeah, they, they, if you look at percent macronutrient intake, it's probably fairly balanced at around 50, 55%. Okay. But if you weigh, if you weigh the number of grams of carb they're having, it is significant. It's like 600 grams a day. If you look at Team Novo Nordisk, best cyclist in the world, you look at Sebastian Sassfield, who just almost broke the Guinness Book of World Record for crossing Canada bike, high carb. Like he couldn't have done it on a low carb diet, right. I don't think, unless he maybe 
trained and adapted over the span of a year, you know, to get the mitochondria up, to get the muscle triglycerides up. Maybe he could have done it, but I, if I had to put money on it, I don't think he could do, could have done it in as good a time. But that argument gets me in trouble on Facebook. It gets me trouble at scientific conferences. I guess the jury's still out. Yeah, right? and I've heard- And that's why we need more research. Yeah, I've heard Dr. Inigo say that, like, we will never see any, like, elite cyclist um, on a ketogenic diet just because they can't afford to adapt because it takes no. like months to years to yeah. fully adapt and no one can afford that. Like if you get dropped into a race, you're going to lose your sponsorship or something. If you can't perform, like, um, I'm not even convinced you could adapt well enough, but you know, that's for people like Inigo and Nick and Dom to argue. I, <laughs> I, I, I see the arguments and I think that's, it's fascinating, you know, to think about stimulating the mitochondria to oxidize fat better. Okay, that makes sense. Let's try low carb for for a month. But do I want to compete with low carb? Or do I want to just train low and compete high, which is kind of where this article nets out that Sam and I wrote. Mm -hmm. And I guess there's two different perspectives, because right now we're talking about performance. But yeah, I was also thinking about it from the perspective of like preventing hypoglycemia by sparing glycogen, because then you're you wouldn't be your muscles wouldn't be taking up the glucose in, <laughs> in this priority. Um, yeah. And, and the thing about low carb is you can search Facebook groups uh, and find a lot of very good examples of people with type one diabetes on low carb. And I believe them because they take pictures of their food and put it on Facebook all the time or Instagram and their glucose is beautiful. Like it's flatter than mine. And they're not having hypoglycemia. If you look at what's called their percent time below range when they use CGM, they are not having hypo like I am. So I think there's some science behind hypoprotection with low carb, less total daily insulin, uh, less glucose variability, which tends to predict hypoglycemia, better insulin sensitivity, I guess, but maybe higher cortisol. But I think that there's something in that that needs a bit more research. And mm-hmm. I've always been impressed by meeting people who can show me such good glucose tracings on their low carb diet. And I try it for, you know, a week, but then I can't, I can't keep it up. <laughs> um, and then, and you brought up like all these um, variables when it comes to glucose. So how does exercise, so say there's a sedentary type one diabetic, like why should they be exercising and what does that exercise do to improve those um, variables when it comes to blood glucose? I don't know whether it it reduces any of the variables, but it seems to make the body a little bit uh, more, I guess, immune to changes that these variables might cause. Uh, Most importantly, though, I think they're exercising not for glucose control, but for other reasons. Like, I think Mm -hmm. that if you look at the epidemiological evidence, the risk of having complications from diabetes drops markedly if you're exercising. We're talking about lowering risk for uh, kidney failure, retinopathy, nerve damage, and heart disease. So that's why I'm exercising. I'm not exercising for better glycemic control because quite frankly, that's hard to show uh, in even in large studies. But I think if you're exercising regularly, you need less total daily insulin. And if you can get away with less insulin, there are some benefits to that. Your body's more insulin sensitive. There's some arguments that may be... Um, hyperinsulinemia or insulin resistance is linked to cancer and heart disease. Maybe insulin resistance drives obesity. So, you know, there's lots of reasons why insulin sensitivity with exercise, low daily insulin exposure is helpful. And one or two studies show that there may be less glucose variability. So your glucose for some reason just seems to be flatter, probably because you know, if you're insulin resistant, the sugar is going up after a meal, then you bolus a big whack of insulin, it's going to go back down. So with exercise training, you flatten that out. Also some work by Jane Yardley and her research team um, in Alberta shows that if you do resistance training, you get this really nice moderating effect of your blood sugar. So I think to mix it up with a bit of resistance exercise, if your blood sugar is on target, maybe a bit of aerobic exercise if your blood sugar is a little bit above target is really the way to flatten things out. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get back on like the different types of exercise, but I did want to touch on, you said lowering total daily insulin requirements. And I've spoken with Andrew Kutnick, who did his PhD with Dom, um, who's a friend and colleague or mentor or all the above. Um, And 
he, the way I understand it is that if we're lowering our insulin requirements, then we're just reducing like risk of variability. Like every time you dose insulin, is there like a chance that you could screw up and blood sugar goes away that you didn't predict or. Absolutely. um, Okay. And, And the more insulin you inject, the more, the more chance for error. And in fact, it's the same with carbohydrates. The more carbohydrates you consume, there's more chance for error in dosing the insulin. Like if you only consume 10, 15 grams of carbohydrates, you just need like a whiff of insulin, typically if you're insulin sensitive. But now if you, if you eat, you know, 500 grams of carb in one meal, your insulin dosing becomes a lot more difficult to judge. So I think that, you know, being physically active, taking not a lot of insulin and not being on a really, really high carbohydrate for a lot of people flattens things out. And yeah. before, before insulin was discovered, you could keep people with like kids with type one diabetes alive, you know, before insulin was invented for, you know, a year or two. And if they weren't on this low carb diet, they, they would just go into ketoacidosis and they die. So, you know, the low carb thing's been around for a long time. I don't, I don't think it's a magic bullet, but I think mm-hmm. it's one other tool that people can exploit if they're mm-hmm. having challenges with their blood sugar management. Yeah. And uh, coincidentally, it's also the 100 year anniversary of the ketogenic diet. <laughs> yeah. Or more <laughs> or more. No, because it's ni- I, 1921. Well, at least because, that's like, well, I can argue on that because I had to do, a his- <laughs> I could do a historical paper where uh, Frederick Allen in the late 1800s, early 1900s, were keeping his patients with type one uh, diabetes alive on these low, very low carb diets. So maybe it wasn't coined a ketogenic diet right. at the time, but it was like what people were kind of doing right, yeah, to, yeah, keep, yeah. to stay alive. Okay. We'll go with the coining of the, the term <laughs> ketogenic diet. Fine. Um, Okay, so back to the types of exercise. So is there one type of exercise that's more beneficial or than than another for type one diabetics? Like, I guess beneficial, I am coming from the perspective of like using exercise to improve glycemic variability. Um, But maybe you look at it more of like, oh, someone's performing. I don't know. I'll let you. Yeah, so okay, well, there have been some meta-analyses done looking at exercise training studies where they did primarily high intensity interval or, or resistance training versus predominantly aerobic. And they kind of show the same effect size on what's called the hemoglobin A1C, which is like your average sugar over the span of three months. Um, I think they're both potentially beneficial and maybe even additive. If you, if you add the two together, you might get a slightly better percent time and range or A1C. I think that Jane Yardley and other colleagues probably would also argue that if you had to pick one, if you had to, like if a gun was to your head, maybe resistance is slightly better because you still get that adaptation in muscle mass and insulin sensitivity. Maybe the mitochondria don't adapt as well, but there's not that hypoglycemia risk. So maybe Jane, we, we could ask her, might favor resistance. I might favor aerobic because I like the mitochondrial adaptations and the energy expenditure that comes with aerobic. And then you might have some people who don't have a side. So it's, it's still hotly debated. And if you were to research this, is it hard to get like approval? Is there a lot of safety measures that go into actually running studies with type one diabetics? Do you have to have an endocrinologist on site? Like what is, what's the logistics for researching this? Well, you know, um, lots of great studies are done um, around the globe. Typically, a physician, an endocrinologist is engaged somewhere along the the way because, you know, insulin is a very powerful drug and it's it's like a prescription drug. In Ontario, it's not a prescription drug because you want to make sure you can buy it if you have diabetes in an emergency at the pharmacy, but it should be a prescription drug otherwise. So typically an endocrinology, it, endocrinologist is on, on oversight. I've done papers with Dr. Bruce Perkins, who lives with type one, who's an endocrinologist. And I've published papers with Ronnie Aronson, who, who basically uh, uh, runs studies out of LMC in Toronto. 
uh, a few studies I've done without physicians, but I'm not a physician. And so if something happens, it, it becomes a problem. So it's mm -hmm. nice to do these physiology studies with a, a licensed physician. Mm -hmm. um, it, because exercise is high risk. You know, it, you could have a high blood sugar event, which isn't horrible, but you could have a low blood sugar event where someone loses consciousness. And yeah. if, you're, if you change the insulin dosing, then that crosses the line on what an exercise physiologist can really do. Um, anyway, that, we shouldn't be afraid of doing these studies. We need to do more of these studies. We could do a head-to-head -head of, of resistance or high-intensity interval training versus aerobic. But the challenge in research is that the patient variability or the individual variability kills the statistical significance. So, so you'd love to do a study of you know, nine or 10 doing resistance and nine or 10 doing aerobic. And if the effect size is small or the difference between groups is small and patient variability is large, then you're not gonna find much. Right. And so we've turned actually now to big data analytics. I oversee this study called the, the Type 1 Diabetes and Exercise Initiative or DEXI study. It's a US study. 600 type 1s are doing exercise in the field, all with wearable technology. And I think we can use engineering approaches and big, big data approaches to see if there really is a difference between the people who mostly do resistance versus mostly do aerobic. Right. But it's not a control that you lose the controlled environment. So there's yeah. always going to be criticism to no matter what studies we try to do. Mm -hmm. And when someone's initiating exercise, like about to go work out or something, is there like an optimal range that they want their blood sugar in before they go exercise for both preventing adverse effects, but also maybe for performance? Yeah. So we put together a, a international consensus working group on this particular topic. Um, led by Otmar Moser, who's a physiology, exercise physiologist who lives with type one in Switzerland. And he uh, and the rest of us came up with this kind of consensus on where you want to be blood sugar wise. And, and the, the, the value is not the normal glycemic range, which for you might be like five to six millimole. We kind of want the person with type one to be kind of at around seven millimole when they do aerobic exercise, because it allows that glucose to drop a little bit with like a safety cushion. And, you know, you can't really turn insulin off right away when you start exercising aerobically. If you have diabetes, like it still is in circulation. So that's why we say like seven's kind of a bit better than, than a normal sugar of five. And now that people have continuous glucose monitors, it's really been valuable because they can see if their blood sugar drops below seven, they're not yet hypoglycemic, because that means you know you'd be below four, but they can have a little bit of of carbohydrate in the form of a sport beverage and then stay uh, above that that critical threshold, which seems to be around four millimole. Mm -hmm. And then if you were doing high intensity, would you want to go in maybe a bit lower? Yeah, you can go in a hair lower. Yeah. Okay. And when correcting for lows, so you did preface this with saying that you are working on some stuff like. In my mind, all I think of is glucagon, like in type one diabetes is yeah. something going wrong with glucagon also. <laughs> yes. Um. Yes. It's the hormone that doesn't get the attention that insulin does in diabetes, but it is dysregulated too. Mm -hmm. In type two diabetes, glucagon uh, at mealtime and after meal is a bit too high. And mm -hmm. so if glucagon is also squeezing glucose out of the liver after a meal, that's not good for type two diabetes. So there's a whole research area where you try to lower glucagon and type 2 diabetes, there's drugs that do this, the GLP-1 analogs do this reasonably well. Um, and experimentally, some people are looking at glucagon antagonists, receptor antagonists. But in type 1 diabetes, when you get low blood sugar, or if you exercise, the glucagon is too low. It's the opposite problem. So my lab has done studies in partnership with other labs, looking at a, a, a injecting glucagon before exercise, because you can now um, find glucagon in a soluble form in a vial or in a quick pen, and you can inject it before you exercise and keep the blood sugar up. And we've also formed a company around some technology that I helped to co-invent, which is a um, somatostatin receptor to antagonist, which basically allows people with diabetes to produce their own endogenous glucagon during hypoglycemia or exercise. And we've actually tested that drug in lots of animal models, but now we're testing it in humans, which is kind of exciting for me to be part of a, 
a study that has gone from concept to animal work with my postdoctoral supervisor at the University of Toronto, Dr. Vranick, to then running studies in my lab at York and then seeing them now run at LMC in Toronto on humans with type one. So that's kind of exciting. That's very cool. So does that mean that alpha cells, pancreatic alpha cells are still functioning and still there? Yeah, they're, they're there <laughs> okay. and they can function, but for some, some darn reason, they're not functioning what, like we'd like them to, either in type two or type one. So I think that there has this a, a bit more attention on this more recently. Like how do we make these alpha cells work more efficiently? We want them kind of turn off glucagon secretion at mealtime and then turn it on during exercise or during low blood sugar, when low, low blood sugar starts to occur. And that's been really tricky to do. Yeah. And is there any like problem with, like, are there long-term problems associated with always correcting with carbohydrates? Like simple, like, could that potentially lead to worse insulin sensitivity or potentially just like weight gain, which would also yeah. be more insulin insensitivity? And yeah, I think you're bang on. I think it, uh, it comes with some unfortunate side effects, everything from like tooth decay. Like when I was hiking in um, Mont Blanc with a bunch of other type ones, the guide said, like, I thought everyone here had diabetes. Like, why is everyone eating candies? Like, isn't that, do you have like a lot of cavities and diabetes? And it made me laugh. I'm like, yeah, like we probably eat more candies than non-diabetics because our blood sugars are low all the time. And that of course can also cause weight gain. And if the blood sugar is too high, it might cause some insulin resistance. So I, I think you're bang on. I think we don't want to have to resort to eating candies and juice and all that stuff. We want right. to lead, lead more of a normal life. For sure. So is that what glucagon could potentially offer you type one diabetics? Like, do you think that that's the future of management? Uh, I think it's, it's potentially a future for some. Yeah, I do. Um, we help a few companies, uh, Zerus and Zealand, who have a glucagon uh, formulation that is much more amenable to putting it in, in, a, in a pump or taking by injection. The problem with glucagon up until right now is that it was this kind of like mix A with B and shake and then drop into a syringe and then inject into the muscle. And to be honest, that delivery system is not compatible with most lifestyles. Because if, if a mother or father wants to treat a kid who's hypoglycemic, like they've passed out, they have to like read the instructions and like figure out how to mix it and then draw it up and then inject it into the kid's thigh. Like, no. So new, new glucagon formulas are much more conducive to putting in a pump or making a, a mini quick pen that you could just shoot under the skin and, and then it works within about four or five minutes. Like, it's incredible. So, mm -hmm. and also there's a Canadian invention called Losemia, where Robert Oranger, whose son has type one, he invented a nasal glucagon. And this was a huge invention because you don't even have to whip out a needle, right? You could just have a little shot of glucagon that gets absorbed into the um, lung tissue and blood sugar goes up. So these are kind of cool inventions that we're watching could change the landscape. Yeah, that's crazy. Is there nasal insulin? Yeah, there is. Don't they use it in like Alzheimer's? <laughs> there, <laughs> there has been nasal insulin invented. And also there is um, an inhaled insulin, which doesn't go in the nose, but it goes in... Um, through the mouth and it looks like you get a fair amount absorbed through the lung alveola as well. And I, I've tried that. Um, I got my hands on some of that because you can get it in the U S and it's called a Freza and boy, it works so much faster than taking a shot by hmm. shot of insulin in the subcutaneous tissue. Cause I think the absorption rate is just that much faster. Oh, interesting. So yeah. is it more favorable? Like why isn't it why, more yeah. common? Well, this is a good question. I think, I think that maybe only around two to five percent of type ones are on this insulin in the U.S., and I think it's because it wasn't marketed very well by the company, and I think because people worry about inhaling, like taking a puffer three or four times a day. Like, what might that insulin do to the lungs? Like, mm -hmm. what might that do to my throat what might that like could that cause lung cancer like no one really yeah, knows so i think thinking. that i think that some people are you know steering away from it because it's kind of new and like is it that much better than taking a shot by, by needle 
it's a little better, but it's not that much better. And the problem with the insulin that you inhale is that it clears very quickly. So if you have a, a mixed meal that has a lot of protein and fat and complex carbohydrate, you kind of need that insulin to last like four or four hours or so. And this inhaled insulin is like gone right. after about 30, 40 minutes. So then it may not be suitable for some meals. Um, Great and, question. <laughs> um, I'm going to jump to a different topic now, but um, if you are exercising and you're experiencing lows, like could that, like say your resistance training, or I guess that would increase your blood sugar. But anyways, would lows attenuate any adaptations to training? Like could it interfere with maybe like not maximal adaptations to training? What a great question. I think that would be an awesome a thesis topic because that hasn't been looked at yet um it, it maybe but maybe not you know what adaptations are we trying to get in our body when we do training like we're trying to lift if we're doing resistance training we're trying to increase our muscle mass and strength if we're doing aerobic training we're trying to increase mitochondrial oxidation uh could it interrupt that i wonder i wonder that would be a really neat study tough to do right because mm -hmm. are you going to ethically try to you know get people to go low when they train and then look at their adaptation so what a great what a great question and and it needs it needs more research i guess and i think i was reading a study the other day saying that like even non-type 1 diabetics usually go low during yeah. exercise yeah yeah so i wonder if you could do it in a, in like a healthy or a non-type yeah. one diabetic population and then see from there also and maybe extrapolate. Yeah, know. that's a great that's a great topic to to think about. I wonder, I wonder. Yep. Yeah. And now with CGM, you know, you can put a, a, a interstitial flash glucose monitor on a non-diabetic and you can really quantify their time below target. It's actually pretty interesting. There's a yeah, company called I'll Super Sapiens. That I'm <laughs> <laughs> so Super Sapiens has now launched um you can get product in um, Europe and a lot of non-diabetic athletes are using that same sensor that you have. Mm -hmm. Although it's the, this is the Libre 2 that has Bluetooth connectivity to a cell phone app. So we'll see that in North America soon. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up. That's <clears> gonna be my last question. I wanted to hear what you thought about like these pro athletes wearing CGMs that are non-diabetics. Like, is there actually utility in developing your training protocols around glucose monitoring? Um, cause like I just play around with a CGM yeah. and like, I like learning about physiology through my own, uh, yeah. experiences. And it teaches me a lot. Like most of my interest is because I'm like, Oh shoot, I just saw my glucose response. This. And then I go and research things. And that really like triggers my, my thought processes. Um, cause I really like learning about glucose regulation. Um, yeah. Like I'm so glad to hear that you find it interesting and maybe potentially valuable because I think we're starting to learn that maybe it does have some value for, for people who don't have diabetes. And I think like for, I first have to just disclose that, that I do work with super sapiens and as I've done consulting with all of these companies. So it comes with a bit of a of a bias, I think there's a, a lot of valuable uh, information that comes from these sensors in, in non-diabetics. And I don't know, you know, you've probably heard of Dr. Martin Gabala at McMaster, Dr. Jamie Burr at Guelph. They all are getting product in their uh, physiology studies because we are trying to learn more about what's happening in these college age students who are trying different exercise training regimens, whether it's uh, you know, high intensity interval training, where blood, blood flow restriction, like all this stuff that's in vogue now, if you add a sensor, you might get more information that's quite interesting. So I'm, you know, I encourage people to reach out to, you know, to me or to others who can get sensors into their hands, uh, because I think it'll teach us a lot. And I, we don't know, we just know the tip of the iceberg, I think, on, on this topic. Yeah. So what are people like, how is an athlete using CGM data to change where, whether they're feeding at certain times or what, like, what is actually like the practical utility? It seems to be very helpful in uh, the training, the training up for an event. So we have seen lots of athletes who have significantly altered their training strategy, uh, mostly fueling. So, um, they might use it for a little bit of low carb adaptations, like to keep their blood sugar at let's say four to five millimold when they're training. But then in competition, they're turning that on 
the flip side and they're fueling a lot more to prevent their glucose from dropping below say six millimole for competition. I think we don't definitively know what the right number is, you know, when you're running in that marathon, but we think we know. And uh, we, th we think that if you fuel at around 60 to 90 grams an hour, but wait for that first fueling to be when your glucose hits six, and then fuel with a certain type of carbohydrate that may have some fructose in it. Uh, we think that if you hold that value at six, you you might do better. And in fact, Kipcho Kipchoge wore the damn sensor and his blood sugar was high the whole time he ran the marathon. And we're thinking, well, it, like obviously high blood sugar is not that bad. The guy has the fastest marathon time in the world. So like, it must be okay. <laughs> and more and more athletes that are wearing super sapiens are telling us that there probably is a sweet spot uh, of around, you know, six, maybe seven millimole. If you can hold your glucose there, because you can see it on your headset of your bike, or you can see it on your wrist reader. By changing the fueling, you might do better. 2% better, 8% better. I, I don't know. But yeah, that's, no, what we're gonna, interesting. that's what we're going to find out. And is this more applicable to endurance athletes? Probably, yeah. probably. Okay. Uh, we don't, we have not exploited the research topic in um, other sports, but maybe it's valuable for their training too. We just haven't really looked at that yet, but others, yeah. others should, like, I think, I think we should all look at that. Maybe it has no value, but maybe it does. Cause is the biggest thing we're trying to prevent is like bonking or like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think so. Bonking is basically the term used where people have symptoms of low blood sugar and it could occur. It could occur in some people at four millimoles, 4.5 others could be three. So we don't like, I don't think there's a number where people bonk. I think it's, it's some symptom. And I think that having a sensor on will tell you what that number is to keep an eye out for. And I think, yeah. have you got an experience with that yourself yet? Have you looked at your sugar, you know, dropping below four and feeling weird or not? So I follow a very low carb diet for the most part. So I never really experience any symptoms of hypoglycemia, even though my mm -hmm. blood sugars can run really low, like mm -hmm. in the sixties sometimes. And I'm like jazzed up and doing work and I feel yeah. great. So I'm, and so most of the time I'll check my ketones and be like, oh, okay, this makes sense. I'm in ketosis. Um, so I actually don't, I wouldn't be able to, um, see if I was experiencing any symptoms like during, but I'm also not an endurance athlete by any means. Like I don't really do any sort of like cardio or anything. Yeah. Um, so well, we do know, yeah. we do know that people who expose themselves to lower glucose, their symptom threshold drops. We know that from very sophisticated studies. Uh, so I think maybe you I think that's okay because I don't think you're at risk of passing out, but it's yeah. kind of good that you don't feel so shitty when your blood sugar drops to right. where it does drop and you're exercising. I wonder if like what a CGM, what CGM data would look like on like a ketogenic, like a fat adapted endurance athlete and like what we have, those we, we, have like. we have looked at that. Um, it looks pretty damn good. Like, you know what I mean? Like it looks really good. It, it It's almost convincing uh, to, for me to try it, although I don't have the exact same physiology because I'm on insulin right. and I don't have glucagon. I don't have the glucagon response that you have when, when you get low. So uh, it, it's quite good. The glucose values are very flat, very low glucose variability. And the mean glucose um, is like 3.8, which is like huh, <laughs> hard to believe they don't have symptoms, but they don't. So I think it's kind of neat. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's very cool. Um, okay. Well, I've taken so much of your time, so I want to respect that and let you get on with your day. But if people want to learn more about your research or anything, where could they find you online or anything you want to say to end off? Uh, well, yeah, you can, uh, certainly follow me, follow me on Twitter. Um, cause I'm trying to get my subscribers up. Everyone to go something. follow him. Yeah. To what's, your like Twitter, what, what's your Twitter handle? Well, it'd be helpful if I knew it. So, <laughs> um, but also you can find me at the York University uh, .ca website. You could just Google uh, Michael Riddell at York U, and um, the Twitter handle is at 
M C R I D D E L L for my last name, uh, one. And uh, it's been a real pleasure. You've asked such amazing questions. I wish you were my grad student. Whoa. You can start your you can start your PhD with me anytime. And uh, thanks for reaching out, Krista. It was a real pleasure. I'm honored that you just said them. Very flattered. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining me today because this was a really fun conversation. And I think that there's a lot of valuable information in here. So I hope you all enjoyed it as well.